But from that point on then, every doctor, and he did a lot of studies on it and stu um, did, you know, has written papers and everything on cannabis. And um, every doctor in Ireland would have had, I mean, uh, worldwide, I think really, um, a little pharmacopoeia in their little bag and hemp or cannabis would have been one of the tinctures um, that would have been in there. There's no question about that. Made in America, eco-friendly alternative to hardwood. So it's beautiful, it outperforms, and you can buy it right here. With Mother Earth in climate stress, can hemp help save the planet? Is hemp a growing industry again? Can we cultivate a greener future for all? And can we end the prohibition? Or will we repeat the history of hemp? China, 15,000 BC, the birthplace of hemp and cannabis. God's gift has been discovered by archaeologists in digs around the globe, demonstrating the importance of the plant to societies throughout history. Industrial hemp had traveled to Japan 5,000 years later, and using ancient trade routes, it made its way to Turkey by 8,000 BC. Then, around 1,000 BC, it was traded heavily throughout Europe, India, and Africa before Spain moved their hemp industry to South America for better cultivation and profits. And then naturally would spread to North America where it would become a cash crop. But what is the hemp plant? So uh, in terms of the farmer perspective, you can sell the fiber, so that's the bottom of the plant. You can sell the grain, which is the top of the plant. You can sell the flour, which is also the top of the plant. That's, that's my head space on it. So in terms of processing, there's a million potential uses for it. The seed is the grain, so it's all the, yeah. So there's, there's three parts. It, and if I was a farmer and I was thinking of it, there's three parts to it. The reality is it needs to be building materials. It needs to be clothing. It needs to be animal food and human food because hemp is only really going to take off if you can get the USDA to approve it for animal consumption. And that's the, that's the biggest misconception there is. Everybody just assumes automatically that it only has, the plant only has one purpose. Well, for myself, I, well, we have a food business. So my product or our product is hemp juice. That's what we started off uh, with a hemp juice. It's, it's a really brilliant product. Uh, and very underestimated. And we also take it and we freeze dry it. And it just create, yeah, it, it's, it's everything that hemp CBD is, you know, I say CBD, I do this because everyone thinks CBD comes in a bottle. The further you remove it from its plant source, the less hemp it really is. Um, and some people would say, well, the closer to a medicine it begets, um, becomes, maybe so. Um, so I'd be a person who would be rather looking at my food source and wanting the food I consume to be my medicine. So we don't take it from its plant material. We leave it within the plant. Everything is there except the fiber, really. Uh, so we remove the fiber in the juicing process. And then when we freeze dry it, then we remove the water, the plant water. So I often say to people, well, you know, what do you want me to remove? Do you want me to get rid of the fat and the protein and the you know, the soluble fiber, you know, why would I get rid of the iron and the calcium and the magnesium? Why would I throw those things away? Um, you know, what's what's not valuable about uh, the salt content? You know, you know, all those micro and macronutrients are really, really important. And I honestly think I'm of course I'm totally biased towards my product, but um, there isn't any other full spectrum product like a juice product or a hemp juice freeze dry product, whatever. It, there's no, nothing else is as f full spectrum because you've got the whole plant. So that's what I do. I take a juice smoothie or a juice, my juice, a couple of cubes in there or a spoon of the freeze dry powder. Perfect. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. So it is really food, really food, you know, no, no messing.
<laughs> hemp food. <laughs> hemp can be turned into products we have yet to discover. But one of the oldest and least known usages of hemp is a food source. Our ancestors use it for the health of their farm, livestock, and own family. Has the United States prohibition of hemp affected the health of humanity? Hemp historians say, yes. I believe that it, it the, the answer to that question is understanding your own body, your own endocannabinoid system, how it's affected by phytocannabinoids, and understanding your own deficiencies. And then when breaking down the components of the actual cannabis plan, understanding what's right for you. So the way that I look at it is the first thing, as I already talked about, it's in your genes. So you have to look at your genetic predispositions. The second thing is understanding what endogenous endocannabinoids you may have a deficiency in and what you can subsidize with phytocannabinoids. So in my opinion, uh, there's a lot of expression of lacking uh, anandamide and other endogenous endocannabinoids because cannabis used to be part of our diets. So uh, hemp and all the different minor cannabinoids within that, animals would eat it, it will be in our water supply, it will be in our food, we'd have that supplement. And because of prohibition, those uh, deficiencies started showing up. And, what, and also there's genetic predispositions. So to give uh, everybody an example, think about it this way. We have a genetic predisposition for a deficiency in this gene called uh, FA, F-A-A-H. What FA does, it produces an enzyme that actually degrades, breaks down anandamide. So I know it's really, really complicated, but I'm going to try to make it easy. Uh, anandamide, the word anon in Sanskrit means bliss. So this is our bliss hormone. Uh, so these are different things that you should be aware of. And what happens is in a stressful event, when we are stressed, somebody cuts us off in traffic or something happens, we then produce a bunch of different chemicals. Uh, so dopamine, norepinephrine, um, cortisol is shot through our bloodstream. And... Uh, when we realize that the lion isn't chasing us in the jungle, then our body starts getting back to normal, homeostasis. And one of the ways that it does that, it releases the endogenous endocannabinoid called anandamide, which is our bliss hormone. When it does that, the goal of the endocannabinoid system is to get us back to normal, balance. However, FA breaks down anandamide. So if you have a genetic predisposition to have a more FA, you have less anandamide. Think about Pac-Man eating an andamite. And because of that, some people are much more prone to being in stress because they're producing less anandamide. And when you're prone to that, what happens is cortisol, which is released in your bloodstream, it's, it sits there. And when it sits there for a while, it raises your pH level. You become more acidic. And when that happens, your immune system doesn't like that. So it addresses that uh, through what we feel is inflammation and discomfort. So understanding that you may have a predisposition to having this stressful event, it's a trickle-down effect. So that can trigger this, can trigger that. So when you consume cannabis and, and quality, number one, you need to understand what cannabinoid and terpene profiles in the formulation are right for you personally. Number two, you need to make sure that you're looking at test results and you're getting your products from brands that have tested. Best testing is not only for uh, heavy metals and pesticides and all that stuff. You wanna know your cannabinoid profile. You wanna know your terpene profile. You wanna know every single substance that you can that's going into your body. So trust those brands. And this includes CBD. This includes every minor cannabinoid and every other substance, like I mentioned before, uh, there's close to 500 different ones that we identified. And a lot of them, we don't even know what they are yet, but they show up in, in test results. So consume responsibly and quality and make sure that you get your products from a reputable source. Because if you feed chickens, and they have studies here at the university for like four years now. If you feed chickens hemp seeds, their eggs are high in omegas and actually are considered a superfood. 
but it's illegal to do on a commercial basis because they haven't done the five or 10 years of FDA studies that are needed for food. And that's where hemp and cannabis and all that stuff is in the predicament because it's so new. They don't have these human consumption tests, which it is right for them to take five or 10 years to figure it out because you don't see all the problems in year one or two. So this year we have planted on our own little plot and we saw this video from a man called William Courtney, Dr. William Courtney. And his advice was, he's, an, he's a Californian, his advice was to juice your hemp. That was what he said. And we were like, oh, hey, never heard of that before. And, and this was really pre-CBD really hitting the market um, back, it was 2013. And um, we, we were already juicing. We had fancy schmancy wheatgrass juicers. We were, you know, growing our own food. We, juicing was a big part of our diet. Um, so it wasn't difficult for us to think how juicing hemp could be really beneficial. And uh, so we just started. And we, like, if you saw the juicer that we started, it was, it was tiny. Okay, it was that tiny. And just, yeah, so the extraction of those phytonutrients, the plant nutrients, um, it is an incredibly densely rich, nutrient rich plant. Um, the, ma the macronutrients, like your carbohydrates and your fats and your proteins, and then all these micronutrients that uh, we didn't even, we analyzed for what we thought was. Uh, probable but you know the list could go on i mean we were shocked to see things like selenium loads of selenium in there loads of b12 and there isn't even supposed to be b12 in plant material hemp and cannabis are still considered a schedule one controlled substance by the feds and proper scientific research in america is difficult and so therefore the fda cannot approve hemp or cannabis for medicine and food however the science is still out there in other countries. And what we learned about the nutritious hemp plant surprised even our director. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a real, yeah, head scratcher. You're kind of going, is this, is this, I mean, do we do this again? Will we analyze this again? Is, is this correct? And we did, we analyzed a couple of different times and just the profile was, is, is phenomenal. It really, really is. It's the powder, our powder, our juice powder is, um, 30 percent fat and 30 percent protein this isn't seed powder now i'm mean, talking about seed powder we're talking about plant material so the juice that comes from the plants freshly juiced um and then freeze dried and that plant material is or that powder rather rather is 30 percent fat and 30 percent protein i mean that's phenomenal in, in a plant profile let's say you know like um, wheat grass wouldn't have anything. Wheat grass powder wouldn't have anything that kind of profile. You know, it's so, it's such a functional superfood. It really, really is. It's it's true. It's amazing. And then on top of all that, you get the cannabinoids too. You know, that that's extra, <laughs> completely. <laughs> You've got all these. I believe. I do believe that in time. Um, cannabinoids will be on the list of mm, essential minerals and vitamins. You know, you've got your vitamin C, vitamin B, what all those, all those, there's a list, a very specific list. And now at the moment, we can't put cannabinoids on that list, but I do believe in time, cannabinoids will be, so that we will be able to uh, actually itemize uh, the cannabinoids uh, um, in terms of our intake value. We, we can't do that at the moment. So, you know, we'll be able to advise people on our labels where and how much cannabinoids that they're consuming per portion or per whatever, we know. Um, so, I mean, it's just so important that it does come into the nutritional data that cannabinoids are entered into the nutritional data for all foods, you know, uh, you know, because I, I think the best source for cannabinoids is, is cannabis or hemp. What happened for me, kind of this, this turning point was when, um, you know, my daughter has epilepsy and she had a grand mal seizure. Um, she's tw almost 21. Um, you know, they took away her driver's license. It was a big deal. And they put her on an anti-seizure medication and she did not do well with it. Well, 
Um, I'm friends with um, the Doctors Knox, if you know them. And if you don't, you should look them up, doctorsnox.com. And they do telemedicine and they are endocannabinologists. They're all tra classically trained physicians, uh, brilliant, brilliant doctors. But they all realized that they didn't learn anything about the endocannabinoid system in medical school. And um, they went back and became endocannabinologists and they do telemedicine. So I set my daughter up with a meeting, with a, um, an appointment with Dr. Janice Knox. And we went through, we sent her the blood panels. We, you know, just a very traditional doctor's appointment, even though it wasn't physically in person, but she had all of her um, test results and everything and all of her scans and, uh, you know, with technology today, it's a miracle. So we sent all that over to her. We had um, uh, an appointment. And Dr. Knox said, hey, you need to be taking full spectrum CBD every day. It's an anti-inflammatory, um, it's an anti-seizure medication. Among other things, she gave her a, a cocktail of terpenes, um, THCA, some um, herbal medicines and things she can get with her food. But we did this appointment and this treatment with my daughter in conjunction with her neurologist uh, Dr. Knox and my daughter's neurologist are working together. We have her off the anti-seizure medication. She's just doing this regimen. It's, I mean, honestly, I could be an activist about this. It gives me goosebumps. What's, what a transformation it did for my daughter. And Dr. Janice in that appointment said to my, my ex-husband and I, who were both there at the appointment, you both should be taking full spectrum CBD. So we both take full spectrum CBD every day. Um, I'd like to see a lot more uh, medical research done on the endocannabinoid system in general and just uh, identifying how and why and, uh, you know, what, what value uh, CBD and THC um, and other cannabinoids that are found in the hemp and marijuana plant are providing um, for your endocannabinoid system and how it helps balance um, your internal system to allow for um, the best performance um, just in everyday life. But what are cannabinoids? And what is the endocannabinoid system? And how is this important to health? Cannabinoids is, as a supplement, uh, we all have this endocannabinoid system that's our primary regulatory system and regulates every other system within our bodies. Think about it this way. Every single system goes through a uh, a neurotransmitter and a synapse, and then all these chemicals shoot into your body. But what the endocannabinoid system does, it's like salmon swimming upstream, is get signals from all the other systems and it regulates the other systems. So the goal of it is to get homeostasis, which is balance. And CBD is just one of those uh, phytocannabinoids that sort of mimics the way our endogenous endocannabinoids work. We have uh, several of them. One of them is called anandamide. Another one is called 2-AG. It's a very long name, so I'll just kind of leave it at 2-AG. But CBD actually stimulates these enzymes and that regulate your immune and digestive system. So for me, when I use CBD, I use it specifically for that intent, which is to regulate my immune and digestive system and to uh, regulate the imbalances that are creating inflammation within our bodies that is making me feel a certain way. So that is the actual goal, and that's how I focus with intent to use CBD on a daily basis. Is hemp and cannabis really medicine? At the start of the 19th century, cough syrup had cannabis in it, as well as alcohol and chloroform. Only one of those substances the body holds onto in the fat cells, and the other two the body rejects as poison. But after the prohibition started, hemp and cannabis the world's oldest, widest used medicine disappeared. Or did it? Hemp and cannabis, along with other herbal medicines, have been used from China to India to even the United States of America. From ancient times to modern day practices, herbal medicine can be used for many chronic diseases, pains and illness. Scientific research continues, and when you go through the list, you can find CBD and THC have great benefits. You can even find specialty herb shops to make your own tea concoctions, salves, and oils for your own health and business startup. 
comes to the healthcare system, yeah, they put a uh, priority on like traditional health medicines, but it's it's pretty much culture wise like if if you got raised in the province i'm sure you would already have an idea on what leaf to use if you have a certain uh, disease or condition rather than you know being able to uh, like instead of buying those uh those pills uh that you can get over the counter or, or with a prescription and that's why you know uh I don't think it's a big problem, but it's not like the healthcare system are are fully going on that route. Of course, they are doing their research and finding what is the best uh, based on all the facts that they're getting and what they are reading from other countries. Um, it's so crazy to me that we wouldn't hesitate to pump our bodies full of chemotherapy. Um, I think about some of my friends, like I have, a, I have a cousin actually who has really, really, really bad Crohn's disease and has had multiple surgeries and parts of his colon removed. Um, and you know, they prescribe chemotherapy and he's like, I'm not taking chemotherapy. I'm going to take cannabis. It's what makes me feel better. For those looking to get off of big pharma, hemp farming might just be the right medicine to a healthier and happier life. Feeling unmotivated and out of touch are days of daily being in the day too much for you. Try Fuck It All. Fuck It All helps minutely with chronic can't deal with this shititis. Do not use our product if you are allergic to our product, which you have never had before and wouldn't know if you were allergic. Some users may feel nausea, dizziness, vertigo, or throw up. Others may have anal bleeding, rectal discharge, lack of sexual appetite, lack of food appetite, swollen prostates, or painful throbbing genitalia. Most users will have migraines, nosebleeds, swollen throats, and vision loss, which may be permanent. Consult your doctor if you have more than one seizure, heart attack, stroke, or aneurysm in a day. This will definitely give you cancer, and you should not take it if you are allergic to cancer. Some poor souls will experience sudden death, slow death, painful death, excruciating death, and also more death. Fuck it all. The one thing to help you get through the fucking day. Fuck it all will happily drain your life, money, and insurance. From your family at Big Pharma. When it comes to painkillers, uh, it's not a big problem here as it is in other countries. And the reason for that is, um, I, I would say it's the culture and uh, being a third world, the people are more focused on uh, supplying or, or being able to uh, fill up their daily needs. Unlike, because they're probably going to worry about having food on the table more than anything else and like if you have it all in you that's when the mental health uh problem kicks in but um i i would say during the pandemic everything like it took a hit on us too but like like i said painkillers weren't a big problem and also i guess another reason is since um the philippines has a lot of herbal traditional medicines that they like to uh, lean on compared to other countries like you know there's a lot of leaves that we use to alleviate pain and of course since being in asian countries all the uh chinese or all the different cultural styles of massages or, or therapy is readily available here than it is in let's say the states or, or in europe so there is no logic in it and i think it it is a follow the money conversation and i think about you know Epidiolex being um, approved and the fact that it's patented and that it has a uh, billion dollars of investment behind it scares me because I feel like if I'm, you know, GW Pharma, I'm not going to let that billion dollars go out without a fight. So I think we're, I think we're going to have some fights in the future. I hope not. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing I think is that there's so many people growing cannabis and self-medicating and doing what they're doing with it that, um, you know, good luck. Uh, we have a, a QR code right on the back of each one of our packets. So then that will link you directly to the uh, certificate of analysis, which is basically the review by a third party um, ha that has tested our product to ensure uh, the quality for both potency and purity. Until the federal government removes cannabis and hemp from the Schedule One drug list, the only way companies can advertise is by calling it hemp. But not all hemp products are created equal. 
That's why testing is so important, and finding a company with transparent test results is crucial to finding a quality product. Hemp has many optional usages, from cloth, to paper, to gas, and even batteries. Henry Ford actually made a car out of it, and it was stronger and lighter than steel. But of course, the steel industry couldn't allow that. The products that can be made from hemp are endless. But let's get back to our friends at Hempwood. You can feed that stuff to your chickens. And then my wife, for instance, will go to Whole Foods and pay double to have a chicken egg that's high in omegas and is a superfood. That's when hemp works. That's when it actually happens. That's how this takes off. Because we need somebody buying the top of the plant and using it for animal CBD because they'll use the top of the plant for animal CBDs with the low CBD content. And they'll use the seeds for human consumption or for replanting. And if it ever comes about, 80, 90% of those seeds then they're going to get fed to animals because that's the same amount of beans or corn that are fed to animals. It would, probably, it would just get a lot more people comfortable with uh, the plant. Um, I think maybe some, uh, a little more education on the fact that there are different parts of the plant and it's not all just the flower because that's what gets all the glory. And that's, I mean, hey, that, that is what gets the glory. That's what's kind of kept it in people's minds. So uh, I think just some education that there are different parts of the plant. Um, legalization would definitely make people a lot more comfortable with it and just make it more mainstream. So it, it would help us. Funny you should bring that up. So we use a local bank here in order to be able to um, bank freely and because it follows state regulation rather than federal. But the Congress came down here and they brought a couple of people to do a tour of our plant and then actually voted in the Fair Banking Act the week oh. after they came to visit for cannabis because they said they needed or wanted to see a hemp company that was making a product not ingested into the body. And we were the only one. So they came and did a tour on a freaking Sunday where I had to pay overtime to everybody. And then um, at the end of their tour and they were visiting the university to the school, uh -huh. they said, um, I heard him say, hey, Mr. Comer, who's our local congressman here, and he was the old ag, um, ag secretary for the state of Kentucky, and he's the one that kind of shepherded in hemp. He said, hey, Mr. Comer, do we got the votes for it? And he said, I'll make sure we do. And they voted in the Fair Banking Act like literally a week later. So that happened here at the factory. I've seen a lot of people get chewed up and spit out already. I've seen a lot of people that get chewed up and spit out. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of where uh, from our round that came into Kentucky in 2019, there's, we're one of only a few still standing from that. So we're very much a small part of that. But, I mean, like I said, we're, most people think of the flower. So grain and fiber was only 6% of what was grown in 2020 in the state of Kentucky. So the rest was all CBD. So it, like I said, the, the flower gets all the glory, but I think that the, the grain has a lot of potential, but that's a long way off. The fiber has some potential. Um, I'm excited to see what, what we're able to accomplish here. There's, we've done a lot. There's still a lot, 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 lot to do. So. Hempwood is perfect for the flooring of your dispensary to display cabinets for your CBD products and for tables for your home crafting. Hempwood is even safe for children or maybe more personal items like an urn and life memorial made from hemp wood to honor a hemp and cannabis enthusiast family member, or create something uniquely special sounding and looking like expert craftsman guitar maker, Ruben Forsland. Um, so that, like the inspiration that I got from him and what he was doing and taking on the challenge of being the first in the world to bring this product 
to the world. Um, I was like, man, I, I want to jump on board with the chap like that and, and see if we can't bring more conversation to what he's doing. Ultimately, that's like, that's what it's about for me to bring awareness to the community, to the farmers that are growing this, that, that have the opportunity to diversify their farm um, and their, their growth of whatever they're growing. Um, obviously, you know, if you deplete the soil with the same product over year after year, you, uh, you start to lose income on the quality of your food or your growth of your farmland. So this is a nice product that they can bring in. Um, and then you st go from the farmers to this fellow that's like visionary Greg Wilson, <laughs> Fibonacci, who, uh, was like, let's let's create something the world can use out of this and replace the need for cutting a lot of trees down. Is 80, 90% something in there is what actually goes to your chickens and goes to your hogs and goes to your cows and goes to all that. And that makes it a widespread product that could be two, three, five. I doubt it'll ever be 10% of what's grown in the United States, but it'll be a single digit percentage of the agricultural field. And then it'll end up allowing us to be a single digit percentage of the wood field or the hardwoods sold in the United States. And that's where we wanna be. That's the impact we want. Instead of cutting down a white oak tree, which are the best ones to hang a tree stand on because that's where the deer come in to eat the acorns. You can keep that oak tree up and use hemp wood in your house or use it in your dispensary. You, or people are starting to make desks out of it. So like mm. work from home desks during COVID, or we have these table kits you can get off of our website where if you're kind of a garage carpenter and you're kind of sitting home trying to figure out what you want to do while uh, the whole world's spinning backwards, it seems like, buy a table kit and put that thing together or get some flooring and decorate your house with it. And yeah, it's kind of expensive. Hardwood is expensive. so. It's not going to work out for a cheap rental property that you're going to end up, tra they're going to trash your house and they're going to rip the floor out every three years or five years or whatever. But if you want to have something that doesn't have VOCs emitting into your house, where you don't feel bad having your kids kind of playing on the floor in your living room, use Hempwood. From food to medicine to making music or making a better world. Hemp isn't just a plant from our past, it could affect our future. But presently, we need legalization first, before we repeat the mistakes of our history with hemp. I don't have a television just because the average American watches about three hours of TV a day. And so I figured I could gain an extra 21 hours a week over the next man just by not having a TV. That sounds good for his mental health. But luckily, you don't need a TV to watch The Cost of Cannabis right here on the Down the Road Show YouTube channel.